Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we get back together once again to continue in our study, in our search of Christianity, now looking for Christianity in our lives. And the evidence of that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So for the past few weeks, that's what we've been dealing with, looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so far, we've looked at love and joy and peace. And in today's teaching, we're going to, we're going to look at, we're going to start looking at patience. Okay? Patience is a good thing to have. I want patience, and I want it now. Okay? Long suffering. Or long suffering, as as the King James correctly says, right? So we're going to do that. Um, but before we do, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask Alice this, this time. Just okay. if you ask God's blessing on our time together sure for a change. Yes, yes. Father, we do. We come before you with humble hearts, and we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Lord, we just ask that this word would be opened up into our hearts, and that the understanding would flow. And Lord, we just pray that nothing would come out of Alan's mouth that isn't from you direct. We just praise you and thank you, Lord, and bless those who are listening. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, now one of the things we're doing, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that we, we his disciples, we the bondservants, we the remnant, are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So the idea is that his redemptive work in our lives the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, would be visible. People need to see Jesus in us. People need to, desperately need to see Jesus. Amen. And you know where they're going to see him? I'm not going to tell you all the places that I can think of right off the bat where they're not going to see him. Uh, a lot of religious places, mm -hmm. they're not going to see Jesus. He has to be visible in us. Yes. Okay? That's the idea. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul, you know, Paul wrote, he wrote to the Corinthians and he said, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Jesus, we're supposed to manifest the presence of Jesus in every place that we go, right? So the new life that we have, the new life that has been a gift from God, has to result in a new lifestyle in our lives. Yes. And that lifestyle is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about the fact that these are linked, all right? They're, it's, it's, it's like a chain. Yes, I'll say this once. I may say it again. Uh, it's a good thing to say. Yeah. Yes. The, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the fruit, not the fruits. That's right. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is like the facets of a diamond. You know, there can be all different facets, mm -hmm. but there's only one diamond. Right. All right? We all play a different part in the body, but there's only one body. And there's only one head to that body, and his name is Jesus Christ. So it starts with love. Love is the foundation, and we talked about that substantially in, in the first part of this study. But the love leads to joy, and that joy gives us a peace, a peace that passes understanding. But that peace will lead for us to have patience, right? right. to have that long-suffering, all right? Today, today, probably about 50 million people here in the United States of America will walk into one of the many, many, many fast food restaurants that dot the national landscape, and they'll spend their share of the $110 billion that's, that stuff the cash registers of those places for fast food. And that was always the idea. It's got to be. Give it to me fast, right? Right. Now, it so happens that, you know, we've had the opportunity to travel much of the world. And Mark and was with us as uh, we lived in Belize in Central America mm -hmm. some, some years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> A lot of years ago. Okay. And we lived out in the bush. Uh, and we, our, our nearest neighbor were, were Frank and Myrtle Clark. Mm -hmm. And Frank was the, kind of the village chief of this little village that we lived outside of. Out, like I said, no running water and electricity out in the bush bush. And in the mornings, Myrtle would make breakfast for her children and for her husband, Frank. 
But making that breakfast was something different than most of us experience in our lives. Because what she would do is she would send some of a few, couple of the boy children. She had 10 children. They'd send a couple of the boys out into the bush, out into the, into the woods, into to the gather jungle. into the jungle to mm-hmm. gather firewood. And then she'd send a couple of the girls with these five-gallon plastic buckets, and they'd go down to the river, and they'd haul water to bring back. Mm-hmm. So the preparation, that, that's what it, you had to get that before you could even begin to think about preparing the breakfast, all right? That's not like going into a fast food restaurant. Mm-hmm. And, and pressing a button or, you know, saying something to the cashier and getting it. But that has, that has I'm going to say, affected our culture. Now, you know what I really want to say? That has infected our culture. Mm. Because all of a sudden, we have become accustomed to having everything right now. Right now. Instantaneous. Yeah. Okay. Here, we're in Orlando, Florida. We're actually, we're, we're in Lake Mary, Florida, filming at, at the moment as we bounce around. And out, right out the window here, we have Interstate 4 that goes from one side of Florida, from Daytona Beach to the other side of Florida over in Tampa, and runs through Orlando. So people who are driving to get to those fast food places, they will most likely be speeding on Interstate 4 to get there. Absolutely. And that's a fact. I, I shouldn't do this, but this is just a little aside. So if the governor of Florida is listening, I have a, an idea for you. I know how you can get rid of the uh, budget deficit. Actually catch the speeders out there, and you'd have such a sur- surplus. surplus. But that's not, I don't want to get there. But the point is, it just seems like everybody is impatient. Yes. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody's impatient. Now, the unfortunate part of this in the church is that because of the culture that we live in, it seems that many, very many, many, many preachers, many preachers, would have you believe that faith gives you the right to be impatient. Now faith. Exactly. Because they will quote Hebrews 11.1, 1, which starts, now faith. And they will proclaim that faith is now faith. So you have to get it, whatever it may be, now. So both the world and much of the church, that's with a small c, by the way, are cultivating, nurturing, and growing impatience in people. However, that is obviously not the Lord's teaching nor his purpose. All right? Mm -hmm. Listen to this from Hebrews chapter 6. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Amen. Abraham, this, you know, kind of the, the father of our faith, so to speak, in the natural, he obtained the promise by patiently waiting. And just, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea here, okay? Patiently waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. That's right. Okay? Remember that breakfast in Belize? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody else is waiting for breakfast. Or even the children that are off in the woods or down to the river, they're patiently, you know, waiting for breakfast. But it doesn't mean that they don't have to participate. It doesn't mean that they don't have to work. Okay? So it's important that you understand this is not about permission for you to sit and do nothing. Okay? Okay? This is why, you know, when you have, to, you have to have that patience, but you have to be diligent to see it happen. Again, whatever it may be, right? Mm-hmm. When Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus about the full armor, the whole armor of God, mm-hmm. right? He describes the whole armor of God, and I'm sure you know this in Ephesians 6, chapter 6. If you don't, please take time during the week and go, I was going to say go read it, go study it, go think about it, go meditate on it, Right? But he kind of ends that by saying, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Right. Okay? You have to do all. That's Ephesians 6.13. Stand on what? Having done a, having Stand right? on the promises of God. Stand on the rock. <laughs> stand on the word. That's right. Stand on the promises. Remember the work. Okay? 
crowds followed Jesus across the sea to Capernaum when he went there. Okay, the crowds followed. That's what it says. When they found him, they 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 talked to him. You know, well, you can go read that too. But it says, therefore, they said to him, "What shall we do that we may do the work, work the works of God?" That's right. They wanted to know, you know, what do we have to do to work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. John 6, 28 and 29. It's about faith. That's it true. is about faith. Our work is to believe, okay? And it's not, even as we study, remember, you don't believe with your brain. No, it's the heart. Okay? You believe with your heart, Paul wrote to the Romans, all right? Because it's also written in Hebrews. Just a few verses earlier than the ones I did, I, that I read a moment ago. This is Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. So you've got to be diligent. You can't be sluggish. You got to do, but it's through faith and patience, those things coupled together, that you inherit the promises. You see, God and His Spirit bear the fruit of patience in our lives, because He has revealed that there is indeed an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for every event under heaven. Ecclesiastes three one, right? Amen. Yes. So there's an appointed time. Patience is like you're not satisfied with the timing, right? You're not, you're not satisfied with the timing of what's happening, what's happening. God spoke through, uh, God, in the book of Daniel, we talked about Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what ne King Nebuchadnezzar said when God humbled him, all right? Daniel 4, 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand to say to him, what have you done? It is God who is sovereign. It is God who is supreme. It is Jesus who is Lord. And he is in control. It is his sense of timing that determines what is going on in our life. God is in charge. And in control. Now Jesus made that very clear when he said, My Father who has given them, that's the redeemed, us, to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. Right. John 10, 29. So as we, as we continue on here, just it's good to remember that this isn't a study of patience. It's about understanding how the Lord looks at us and how we are to examine ourselves and how the world sees us, or doesn't see, Christ's redemptive work in us. The purpose of this is what Paul wrote to the Colossians, so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, 10, 11. To attain steadfastness and patience. Okay? Okay. Impatience is cultivated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything is cultivated. Absolutely. Whether I mean, it's ha if it's a ha habit, ha yeah, but it's reinforced. That's what we mean by cultivating. Mm -hmm. Well, because we're bad. When when God formed Adam, He took him and He put him in a garden. And the first, by the way, the oldest profession. Uh, what's the oldest profession? Gardening. That's right. Cultivating. Cultivating. God made man to cultivate. All right. Cultivating is you are through your efforts. You're determining how something's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. If you're growing a tree, or you know, it's the work that you're doing that determines how it's going to grow. All right. So impatience is cultivated by that evil which Paul places at the gateway of gateway sin to, to his list in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Love of self. 
right? Right. That when you love yourself, you become in control of your life. Mm -hmm. You determine. You become the lord of your own life. The center of your and that, universe. And that cultivates impatience. Because now, everything you want is dependent upon your sense of timing. Mm -hmm. Not God's sense of timing. The love of self that he speaks of there in, to, in his letter to Timothy is destructive because it's all-consuming. It leaves no room for true love. Self-love leaves no room to consider others. Other people and situations only become aids or obstacles to what we're doing. They're pawns in the kingdom of our own lives. Mm -hmm. All right? That's hardly the self-denial that Jesus demanded of his disciples, and certainly not the type of life that would show forth the evidence of the Lord's work in us. We're supposed to be selfless. Yes. Okay? When you become a lover of self, you become impatient with everything mm -hmm. because nothing will happen on your schedule. You probably know, and that's because we've mentioned it, that the King James translate this, translate this word in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as long suffering rather than patience. That's, cer that's, that's certainly because this patience is about dealing with things that are typically unpleasant to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? You, you know, you don't, you don't suffer through something you like. Right. You suffer through what you don't like. All right? But you have to understand that God is in control. So one of the, one of the things that's really important about patience is understanding that what it is, it's having confidence in our Lord's timing, yes. His timing of events, the events in our life. When you understand that He is in control of what's going on, the events in your life, well, that's how you cultivate patience. Because you know that what He does, His goal is, whatever He does is going to work for our good. And for His right? glory. And for His glory. Patience is about having confidence in our Lord's timing. When you believe Him, when you're sure, when you're certain that His sense of timing is the best sense of timing, then it's going to be easy for you to be patient, to wait it, to wait it out, to suffer long through it. Because you know, at the you, you're dealing with the truth of the Word of God. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. So you're looking forward to the end. I, I got to tell you. There's a difference between being impatient and being eager. Right. Yes. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a difference between impatience and being eager and being anxious. Yes. And we use those words wrongly so much. Um, you know, I think there was a time when I would have easily said, I'm anxious for the coming of the Lord. I'm not anxious for the coming of the Lord. I'm at perfect peace because peace is the fruit of the Spirit that preceded this. Right. Right. Anxiety is the absence of peace. Yeah. It's so, I, so yeah. yeah, so I have I have peace, but I am eager for the coming of the Lord. Yes. And we we are instructed to be eager for it. Otherwise, this word of God would not tell us that we should be praying. Even so, so come, come Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus right? Amen. Yes. Patience is about, as I just said, having confidence in our Lord's timing of events in our life. Mm -hmm. It's about trusting the one that Peter was speaking of. When he wrote this in 2 Peter chapter 3. Mm -hmm. But do not let this one fact escape you. Don't let it escape your notice. Beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Amen. <clears throat> I guess that's a different sense of timing. All right? But that's what it says. And by the way, Peter spoke that because he had... He knew that from, from the Psalms. It says there's a Psalm of, of Moses uh, in the 90s somewhere, and that's what it's, right, yeah. where it's saying the same thing. So it's just not a standalone verse. Right? Impatience is caused by or is about other people or situations, people or situations that interrupt or delay our plans and purposes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? When you have a plan, when you have a, when you're doing, when you're doing a task, when you have something, and it doesn't go according to your plan, then you become impatient. It may be when you're on online at a bank, checking out at a grocery store, driving to a place that you're headed to, or you know, and, and the traffic is going slow. 
Isn't aren't these the things that rise up in patience in your life? We're in such a hurry. Because you're in a hurry. Patience is about enduring. It's about putting others before ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that should be that should be the fruit of our life, because that's about love, putting others before ourselves. So remember, earlier in the study, we looked at the Apostle Paul's spirit-inspired description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And it starts with these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Mm -hmm. Love gives birth to patience and kindness. Amen. Love, joy, peace, peace. patience, kindness. kindness. Patience coupled with kindness and powered by love will lead to, can lead, I was, uh, no, no, okay, it will lead, yeah, I'm sure, will. to glorious interruptions. That's right, I was just <laughs> thinking about that. Yes. Glorious interruptions. Now that has to do with, with kindness. Nice. You know, you, I said, the, the thing that upsets you and the reason you get impatient is because all of a sudden your plans have gone awry. Right. But when you are being led and the only thing that matters to you is are his plans. That's right. How he determines. Do you do you think that that the world has the power to stop God's plans? Not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. So you know you're you're driving someplace and all of a sudden you know the traffic gets. You know what? God's in control. God is in control. I don't know if this is um, appropriate at this time, but I, it just what made me think of this the topic is when you were working at that um, satellite communications. And you were on a on the way oh. to a, a very <laughs> extremely important. Yeah, I have to share that with you. Now. That, appointment. Yeah, I was the national sales manager for a communications company up in New York, and going to work there was like going to a revival every day. I mean, we just saw the hand of God at work. Now you have to say this was in the seventies before cell phones. Absolutely. Yes, it was in the it was in the seventies yes. when I was young and cute and <laughs> didn't have a cell phone. Nobody had cell phones. All right. And I, one, one of my salespeople, a believer too, uh, had asked me to go on a very, very important call to a major corporation, a Fortune 500 co company. And there, she was about to close a very, very large deal. So she had asked me to go along with her to, to make the presentation. So we were in New York, as I said, and this place had a campus uh, uh, maybe 25 miles outside of the city. I, I may be a little inaccurate. And you had to take a winding parkway to get there. And by the way, in New York, if you have an appointment, a business appointment, I want to tell you something. You're there on time. If you're not there on time, you're, there is no appointment. As a matter of fact, more often than not, if you're not there a few before, before time, you're not, you don't have an appointment yeah. anymore. So we were driving up there. I was driving. And as we came around one curve on this parkway, we came upon... A, a car broken down by the side of the road, and there were two older um, African-American black women sitting, standing by their car, and it was broken down. So Terry was the name of the uh, salesperson, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and we thought, now if we stop, you know, we blow this appointment on a gigantic deal. So we looked at each other, and I pulled off the road because there are priorities in life. So we spent probably the better part of 45 minutes, maybe an hour, I don't even remember, um, with these two ladies, and we got them, we did get them squared away, we got them... Sorted. Uh, we got them sorted, yes, yeah. we got, got the situation sorted and got them help and everything. So now we continue driving up to our appointment, pretty certain that we didn't have an appointment, that we had missed our opportunity for this very large sale. So when we got there, we walked into, they have, you know, a big, big entrance foyer and a reception area. And we walked up to the receptionist and announced ourselves and said, you know, we have an appointment with, with this fellow who's a, a vice president of the company. And she said, I let him know you're here. So we went down and we sat down and we're, we're sitting in the reception area and, and we're both thinking, you know, we've, we've really blown this. And but we're still trusting in God and praying. And, and this fellow comes walking out into the reception area. And as he comes walking out, he's literally he's shaking his head, holding himself like this. And he walks up to me and he walks up to Terry and he says, he says, I don't know how to apologize. He said, I am so, so sorry. He said, I have never kept anybody <laughs> waiting so long. <laughs> he 
You see, that was a glorious interruption Absolutely. that we had. Absolutely. And as God had us occupied doing His work, giving a little kindness to somebody that That's we encountered, right. That's right. God dealt with that man and kept him occupied. <laughs> so not only not only did you know we had him at a disadvantage That's because right. he thought he had been mean to us. So, that, but that's there are so many instances of Jesus, you know, he's on his way. A, a, a man had come to him and said, my daughter is dying. You know, she's, she's sick. And he said, I'll go. Let's go to your house. But along the way, a woman walks up and touches the hem of his garment and pow, this parade stops. Yeah, that's right. It was an interruption. It was a glorious interruption. interruption. If your life is not filled with glorious interruptions, or if they're not glorious interruptions, where you're seeing the hand of God, Stop your plan to work his plan. That's right. You're missing out. You really are. It's but sometimes but sometimes we're so impatient yes. and so locked into our schedule. We miss it. That we'll we'll, it. we'll, we'll run right along and miss it. That's one of the things um, you know, at my job I have to do what they want. And I can get some jobs and I get plans, and I say, okay, do this, this, and this. And then they give me something else, and those plans just... Oh, right out the window. Right out the window. <laughs> and you have to do what they say, That's and right. it's being submissive to That's right. that authority. Absolutely. And doing what God wants, you're submissive to his authority. Amen. Amen. That's right. Because you're <clears throat> supposed to do your work as unto, unto the Lord. Lord. Right. And do all things as unto the Lord. So... When you're being submissive to your to your boss at work, you aren't being submissive to God. When you're speeding on that I four, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. you're and you're not being submissive to the law, God. you're not being submissive to God. That's right. That's another story. But like I said, kindness is locked into patience. Yes, They're is. all locked in. So if you lose your patience with somebody, you're certainly going to lose your kindness with That's them. That's right. You're not. You're going to. You're going to become irritated. Anger. Right. You're going to be irritated yeah. with them. All right. It'll turn into anger. If, yeah. Because what happens? You start to think of those people as a hindrance to you, a hindrance to our plans, a hindrance to your purpose, slowing us down or standing in the way of what we want to do, exactly. what we want to say. So we won't be. We'll, we'll not behave kindly to them. That's simply a fact. Now the King James version translates that word. Kindness in Galatians 5 as gentleness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's pretty much uh, common among, the, but the kindness is more common in most of translations today. And I, I just want to say this to King James. If you check, you'll find that the King James translates that Greek word over and over and over as kindness rather than gentleness yeah. through the Bible. And that's really, really important because you'll see. The power of the word, the, of the root of the word kindness, when we gather once again to continue this study and the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the wow. evidence of a redeemed life. But until then, Father, we just thank, thank you, Lord Jesus. God. Lord, we thank you that you are in control of all that we do, of all that we say. Lord, as long as we are surrendered to you, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, knowing that your purpose, your plan in our lives is most assuredly better than our purpose and plan in our lives. But as we have the mind of Christ and grow more and more, that everything we would do would be Christ-like, who said, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Amen. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last